Henry Hill, portrayed by Ray Liotta in the movie Goodfellas, is a captivating figure in the world of organized crime. What makes him intriguing is that he didn't have a high body count, a long-standing career as a mafia boss, or a lengthy rap sheet. However, his life story became the basis for a famous book and an acclaimed movie, which certainly isn't without reason. Henry Hill was a first-hand witness to a wide array of criminal activities, including murders, fraud, robberies, and prison time. He courageously revealed these secrets to the world. Even before the movie was made, he had a target on his back within the criminal world. However, once the film exposed the inner workings of many gangsters, Henry lived in constant fear, knowing that there was an open season on him. But did they ever catch him? Henry Hill turned out to be an extraordinary individual. Unlike many other gangsters, he spoke coherently and intelligently, occasionally flashing a smile. He possessed an in-depth understanding of the world he grew up in. Yet he discussed it with an unusual detachment, often offering an outsider's perspective. These qualities were noted by Nicholas Pileggi, whose novels inspired Martin Scorsese's films Casino and Goodfellas. Henry Hill Jr. was born to Henry Hill Sr., an Irish-American electrician, and Carmela Costa Hill, a Sicilian-American woman. Growing up in a modest household with seven siblings, Henry's early exposure to a life of crime was almost inevitable. As a young boy, he idolized local gangsters and frequented a cab stand where he mingled with criminals. It was the owner of this cab stand, local capo Paul Vario, who provided Henry with his first job, performing minor errands in 1955. Henry's decision to drop out of school led him deeper into the world of gangsters. He was drawn not only by the mysterious allure of their lifestyle, but also by the simple fact that these criminals treated him far better than his own parents did. His father's physical abuse was a stark contrast to the gangsters who showed him kindness. Henry gradually became involved in various criminal activities, such as selling cigarettes, parking cars, and assisting at the bar. Over time, he grew accustomed to the criminal world because of his responsible nature and proficiency in his assigned tasks. Despite his dedication and loyalty, Henry faced a significant obstacle in rising through the ranks of the Lucchese crime family. Even though his mother was of Sicilian descent, Henry's mixed heritage posed an issue. Mafia tradition dictated that only those of Italian lineage could be full members, while others could, at best, attain the position of a second-in-command. Another option was available to Henry, joining the Irish Mafia where he wouldn't encounter such restrictions. However, he had little interest in the Irish Mafia and the prospect of starting from scratch. Looking ahead, Henry Hill never achieved the status of a major player in the Mafia hierarchy. Nevertheless, he possessed a profound understanding of how the criminal world operated and how to get things done. His knowledge and abilities earned him respect. Seven years later, in 1967, the first high-profile case emerged. It is often said that thieves adhere to a code of honor, but the reality is quite different. They committed heinous acts, killing whomever they pleased, including women and children, sometimes with a sadistic thrill. In the year 1967, Henry Hill became involved in the infamous John F. Kennedy International Airport robbery, during which approximately half a million dollars was stolen from a storage facility. The plan revolved around information provided by one of the guards who disclosed that a substantial sum, ranging from $400,000 to $700,000, would be in the terminal vault during his shift. All that was required was for someone to enter the airport, pretending to have lost their luggage, pick up the money, and exit the building. However, a significant obstacle arose. The guard who had shared this information didn't possess the key to the vault. The key was held by the senior guard, who was not under the influence of the mob. To resolve this dilemma, the mafia-affiliated guard decided to befriend his colleague, discovering that the senior guard had a weakness for prostitutes. The guard arranged for his amorous colleague to meet a prostitute at a motel. During this encounter, the prostitute discreetly took the key from the senior guard and handed it over to the mafia guard. Simultaneously, the same woman distracted the keyholder, keeping his attention on herself. On the night of April 7, 1967, at precisely 11.40 p.m., Henry Hill and Thomas de Simone entered the cargo hold of an Air France plane without encountering any resistance. They managed to retrieve $420,000 without firing a single shot. Adjusted for inflation, this sum is equivalent to roughly $3 million. This audacious heist significantly enhanced Hill's credibility and reputation within the criminal circles of New York. 
However, as the years passed and Henry continued to engage in unlawful activities, he began to question the path he had chosen. By June 1960, Hill had enlisted in the Army, marking a pivotal moment in his life. Henry had little enthusiasm for serving his country, but his life took a turn when the FBI cracked a major case. Faced with the need to evade relentless law enforcement, Henry went into hiding for a while. His time in the Army did not transform him into a model soldier. Instead, his rough nature persisted. He immersed himself in gambling, alcohol, and even sold food from the Army's kitchen. His misconduct escalated to the point where Henry faced a military court conviction for fighting and stealing the local sheriff's car, leaving him far from the right path. Three years later, after returning from military service, Henry became increasingly embroiled in the criminal underworld. Teaming up with a few fellow criminals, he orchestrated numerous significant crimes, including loan sharking, fraudulent accounting, and dealing in stolen goods. It was during this period that he formed close ties with two other gangsters who would profoundly impact his future. James Burke, portrayed by Robert De Niro in Goodfellas, and Tommy D. Simone, portrayed by Joe Pesci. James Burke initially made a name for himself as a car thief. Although he earned the nickname The Gentleman because he would inform truck drivers ahead of time that he intended to rob them, he had a dark and violent side. Rumors swirled that he had killed and dismembered his fiancée's ex-boyfriend. One of his twisted pastimes involved placing the infants of his victims inside refrigerators while forcing them to listen to the cries of their dying offspring. Despite his brutal tendencies, he proved to be a valuable enforcer for the mob. However, like Henry, Jimmy Burke's Irish heritage prevented him from rising too high within the Lucchese crime family. Paradoxically, this shared limitation brought him and Henry even closer. The real Henry Hill later remarked that the portrayal of Tommy D. Simone in Goodfellas was 99% accurate, with the only notable difference being Tommy's imposing physical stature, a significant departure from the short Joe Pesci who played the character. D. Simone was every bit as ruthless and sadistic as Jimmy Burke. He took pleasure in acts of cruelty, such as throwing darts into his adversaries' faces and marking his gun for each person he killed. He didn't hesitate to inflict horrific pain, even resorting to ripping out his victim's nails. In one particularly gruesome instance, Tommy killed a man in the street purely for his own amusement. When Henry asked him why he was so cruel, Tommy's chilling response was, Because I'm a tough guy. Henry, on the other hand, was different. In his own words, he had never killed anyone. When confronted with such brutality, he attempted to remain composed. He knew that showing weakness could lead to severe consequences. Witnessing people being killed and having their eyes gouged out was a grim part of his reality, yet he often concealed his inner turmoil with a smile, pretending that everything was fine. While Henry was unquestionably involved in criminal activities, he believed he had a conscience, a distinction he drew from these ruthless individuals who lacked any moral restraint. Despite these glaring differences, Henry found himself deeply entangled in criminal enterprises with these men, who, in a twisted way, had become his friends. These very individuals would eventually turn against him. A pivotal event occurred on June 11, 1970, which would have far-reaching consequences for Henry, and in particular, his associates or so-called friends. William Bent Vina, also known as Billy Batts, belonged to another crime family, the Gambinos. He had been released from prison in 1970, and a party was thrown in his honor. During the festivities, Billy Batts encountered Tommy D. Simone and jokingly inquired if he was still shining shoes. Tommy, taking offense, saw it as an insult. Later that night, when the sweet nightclub owned by Henry Hill was nearly empty, D. Simone confronted Billy Batts and struck him with a gun. However, the Lufthansa heist marked the beginning of their downfall. The crime bosses instructed Parnell Edwards, known as Stax, to dispose of the vehicle used in the heist. While en route to the disposal site, Stax became intoxicated with marijuana and mistakenly parked the vehicle near his girlfriend's house. Unaware of the situation, Edwards went to sleep. In the morning, the police discovered the van, realized it had been stolen, and had it towed to an impound lot. The FBI suspected two criminal organizations' involvement in the heist, one led by John Gotti and the other by James Burke. Wiretaps recorded conversations that hinted at the involvement of the robbers, including references to items from Lufthansa. However, investigators couldn't find concrete evidence at the time. Jimmy Burke had become increasingly paranoid, and his concerns were well-founded. The Lufthansa heist had garnered widespread attention. 
making headlines on television, newspapers, and in everyday conversations. Naturally, the FBI was actively pursuing the case. Jimmy feared the slightest leak of information, and he took drastic measures to protect himself. Those who posed potential risks were swiftly dealt with. Parnell Edwards, unable to dispose of the truck in a timely manner, met a tragic end in his own home. Joe Buda Manry and Robert McMahon, both involved in planning the heist, were executed with shots to the back of their heads. Martin Krugman, a Whig salesman featured in Goodfellas, was also eliminated. Louis Cafora, who had purchased a pink Cadillac for his wife shortly after the robbery, disappeared without a trace, and his body remains undiscovered. Within six months of the heist, ten individuals with potential knowledge about the mastermind or perpetrators met their demise. Jimmy Burke signed the death warrants for nearly every mafia member involved in the robbery, even though he had shared many years of association with them. Soon, Tommy DeSimone met a grim fate. He wasn't killed solely for his involvement in the heist, but rather for a series of reckless actions and misdeeds within the Mafia. Tommy had spiraled out of control, committing numerous murders, including those who had established themselves in the criminal underworld. Nine years had passed since the murder of Billy Batts, who had insulted Tommy by questioning whether he was still shining shoes. However, this unresolved murder had not been forgotten, and Tommy was held accountable. His extensive list of transgressions and unresolved issues led to his elimination as a common soldier, a harsh but common fate in the criminal underworld. Henry Hill was unquestionably a gangster, a career criminal involved in various scams and acts of violence. Henry Hill possessed the skills to manipulate and had a deep understanding of the criminal world. He was a true racketeer, a formidable presence in the underworld. However, chaos began to envelop his life. Jimmy Burke's behavior became increasingly erratic and Tommy DeSimone met a violent end. Before Tommy DeSimone initiated the brutal assault on Billy Batts, he taunted him with the insult, shouting, Shine those damn boots! Tommy and his partner in crime, Jimmy Burke, were active participants in the savage beating. The motives for this attack, as depicted in the movie, were intertwined with the insults, but also rooted in financial disputes involving Billy Batts and Jimmy. After the vicious beating, Tommy, Jimmy, and Henry Hill placed Billy Batts' battered body in the trunk of Hill's car, intending to transport him to an appropriate burial site. However, during the journey, they decided to finish off Billy Batts upon hearing his half-dead voice emanating from the trunk. The aftermath of this gruesome act haunted Henry profoundly, causing him to experience recurring nightmares and bouts of nausea. In the mid-1960s, Henry Hill crossed paths with Karen Friedman, a Jewish woman whom he soon married. The couple had two children, a son named Greg and a daughter named Gina. Greg at one point expressed his deeply negative perception of his father, describing him as a wife-beater, thief, gambling addict, alcoholic, cheater, and drug dealer, stating that he had nothing positive to say about him. Gina initially held a more sympathetic view of her father, but her perspective eventually shifted. Both Greg and Gina attended regular schools where they had to grapple with explaining their father's troubling behavior. Henry later acknowledged that his children never held a strong affection for him. His relationship with his wife, Karen Friedman, was also tumultuous. Characterized by periods of intense adoration followed by severe anger and conflict. The marriage finally came to an end in 1989 when Karen divorced Henry Hill while he was in hiding from the Mafia. Despite having a family, Henry Hill had no intentions of abandoning his criminal pursuits. He continued his close partnership with Jimmy Burke and together they embarked on a trip to Florida to collect a substantial debt from a card player. However, the gambler was reluctant to part with the money, leading to a severe beating. This incident caught the attention of the police, resulting in Hill's immediate arrest and subsequent appearance in federal court. The court sentenced Hill to a 10-year prison term, but he served only a portion of it. During his time behind bars, Hill became involved in drug dealing and spent his free hours mingling with fellow Mafia members. In July 1978, Hill received an early release thanks to Paul Vario. Shortly after regaining his freedom, Vario arranged a job for Hill at his nightclub. Within two days, Hill flew to Pittsburgh, a move that blatantly violated his parole. In Pittsburgh, Hill encountered an individual who owed him a significant sum of money. Instead of paying in cash, the debtor handed Hill two suitcases filled to the brim with marijuana. Reluctant to board a plane with the contraband, Hill opted for a bus ride and immediately delved into the drug trade. 
Henry couldn't reconcile with the notion he had heard early in his criminal career that being a gangster was preferable to being President of the United States. Despite orchestrating the largest heist in U.S. history, the Lufthansa heist, the case was unraveling in unforeseen ways. Henry continued his involvement in drug dealing and it was only a matter of time until he faced consequences. In April of 1980, during another drug deal, he was arrested. After being released on bail, Henry's life was gripped by fear. He suspected that his own associates might eliminate him for violating mafia rules against drug trafficking. Then came the devastating news that his patron, Paul Vario, the 70-year-old mafia boss with whom Henry had spent his childhood, had severed all ties. Even more alarming, Jimmy Burke, Henry's closest friend, attorney, and partner in numerous schemes, was plotting his murder. The countdown to his potential demise was measured not in days, but in mere minutes. Faced with this dire situation, Henry made the life-altering decision to enter the Federal Witness Protection Program. His wife, Karen, and their children effectively disappeared from existence alongside him. Henry Hill's arrest turned out to be a fortuitous break for law enforcement. Having grown up within the Mafia, Henry possessed invaluable knowledge. He understood the inner workings of the system, knew who held the power, and was privy to the locations of buried secrets. The police recognized that if Henry Hill cooperated, they would gain access to a treasure trove of information, leading to numerous arrests and indictments. Henry realized that even if he remained silent, his friends might ultimately eliminate him, much like they had done with everyone involved in the Lufthansa heist. The outcome of Henry Hill's cooperation with the authorities was the conviction of Jimmy Burke, who received a 20-year prison sentence. However, two years later, federal authorities uncovered Burke's involvement in a brutal murder, resulting in his sentence being changed to life imprisonment. Paul Vario initially received a four-year sentence, but in 1985, while still incarcerated, he faced additional charges related to organized gang extortion, extending his time behind bars. Vario passed away on May 3, 1988, at the age of 73, due to respiratory failure in Fort Worth Federal Prison. In September 1981, Henry Hill crossed paths with crime writer Nicholas Pileggi, and nine years later, Martin Scorsese's acclaimed film, Goodfellas, hit the silver screen, portraying Henry Hill's life. Contrary to expectations, the film did not provide financial stability for Henry. He did not receive any percentage of the profits from the movie, and the half million dollars he received from Scorsese for the rights to his life story had been swiftly spent. For the rest of his life, Henry reverted to his old ways, dealing drugs, engaging in fraud, showing little regard for the law, and ultimately squandering any money he had left. While Jimmy Burke was still alive and incarcerated, he made a second attempt on Henry Hill's life by placing a $2 million bounty on him. The film had catapulted Henry to fame, making it even more challenging for him to remain hidden. Furthermore, he had already been expelled from the Witness Protection Program due to numerous legal violations. In 1996, Jimmy Burke passed away from lung cancer. Nonetheless, the hunt for Henry continued, as treachery in the underworld is rarely forgotten. The final years of Henry Hill's life were marked by sadness. He made repeated attempts at rehabilitation but struggled to overcome his addictions to drugs and alcohol. His family life was fraught with difficulties, and he rarely appeared in public, striving to live modestly. Henry was acutely aware that he would remain a target for New York gangsters for the rest of his life. However, Henry Hill did not meet his end through violence, be it by bullet, knife, or noose. He passed away on June 12, 2012, just after celebrating his 69th birthday, officially attributed to heart problems. Ray Liotta, who portrayed Henry in Goodfellas, passed away a decade later at the age of 67. Henry Hill maintained that he had never personally taken a life, though he had witnessed gruesome acts of violence, dismemberment, and burial, and had been an active participant on numerous occasions. He claimed to possess a conscience, which did not prevent him from committing acts of violence, bank robberies, and engaging in various scams. Henry Hill is a complex character, and his story served as one of the earliest accounts of a gangster's life that was reasonably accurately depicted in a film. From the perspective of viewers, this may be seen as a positive outcome, but in the eyes of the Mafia, he remained a snitch, a rat, an outcast who chose to cooperate with the FBI. Henry Hill was, at his core, a gangster. The year 1978 marked the pinnacle of Henry Hill's criminal activities. Although the family had a strict rule against its members dealing drugs, 
Hill brazenly operated one of the largest drug distribution networks spanning multiple states. He peddled various narcotics, including marijuana, cocaine, heroin, and methaquilone. Despite the immense profits, every drug dealer faced the looming threat of a lengthy prison sentence. Paul Vario recognized this danger and was determined to avoid spending his remaining years behind bars. If news of Henry, Jimmy, and Tommy's involvement in the drug trade reached Pauly, the consequences would be dire, potentially resulting in the demise of all involved. In 1978, Henry Hill was treading on dangerous ground. During that year, Hill and his associates embarked on another lucrative venture, one that involved manipulating American basketball games, a scheme known as point shaving. Point shaving entails rigging games to achieve a predetermined score difference. In this case, two newcomers, the Morocco brothers, joined the Boston Eagles basketball team at Boston College. While not considered top-tier basketball players, they had the right connections. Initially, they conspired with the team's primary point guard, Rick. These athletes were granted permission to wager the money they earned, aiming to double their earnings. A federal investigation in the early 1980s uncovered that none other than Henry Hill, a member of the Lucchese crime family, was the mastermind behind the Boston basketball operation. After an unexpected loss by the Boston Eagles to the Providence Friars resulting in significant betting losses, Henry and his crew concluded that three bought players were insufficient to guarantee the desired outcomes. They proceeded to bribe more players during the winter of 1979, involving a total of four key basketball players in the conspiracy. As the scheme evolved, athletes began receiving compensation consisting of a minimum of $2,500 and an ounce of cocaine per game. Over the course of the season, they rigged a total of nine games. Henry, Jimmy, and Tommy appeared to be ascending to a higher level of criminal activity, opting to play big. This meant handling substantial sums of money, but it also came with heightened risks. However, their criminal exploits did not end there. In 1978, they orchestrated the Lufthansa heist, the largest heist in U.S. history. On December 11, 1978, several armed individuals wearing ski masks approached vault worker Carrie Whalen. During the Lufthansa heist in 1978, the robbers took a brutal approach to get what they wanted. They concealed their faces, subjected vault worker Carrie Whalen to a beating, and made chilling threats about knowing where his relatives lived. Under duress, Whalen agreed to cooperate. Upon reaching the vault, the intruders intimidated the other employees, compelling them to summon the sole guard who knew the access code. In compliance with the robbers' demands, all the employees cooperated as the intruders made off with two bags containing money and jewelry. The criminals fled in a vehicle executing the heist in just over an hour, well before sunrise and before the police were alerted. They made away with approximately $5 million in cash, which would be worth around $18 million today, as well as jewelry valued at $875,000, equivalent to $3.1 million today. At the time, it stood as the largest robbery in the United States, leaving the perpetrators euphoric.